bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I greet you in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. My name is Elijah of Sound Doctrine Deliverance Ministries, a ministry without walls. I bless you from the city of Emporia, Virginia. I greet you in the name of Jesus. I love you to life. I thank you for those of you who are able to be a part of this study on this evening. <clears throat> I say all the studies are good, but this one is again destroying one of the lies we've always been told. One of the myths of the church is really, really good. And again, it's meat. It's not for babes. It's not for super sensitive people is for people who really want to get into the truth of God's word and understand and live by God's word. So again, I greet you as always. I'm going to give some of our, our faithful participants, our faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, just a few more minutes in case you're finishing up your dinner, in case you're like I did, had to work some overtime today and you're getting off from work, in case you're dealing with the children or or the spouse, or whatever you may be doing, I'm going to give you just a few more minutes before you get yourself together and, and get ready for this study. I'm telling you, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, listen to me. If you never listen to another promise that I made, listen to this one. I promise you, if you listen to this study in its entirety, and if you put it into practice, I promise you it'll change your life. It's impossible not to. Because as always, <clears throat> you know, I don't believe in tradition. I don't believe in cliches. I don't go along to get along. I don't follow the crowd. God did not call me to be that. God called me to be real. God called me to be transparent. God called me to be a teacher of his holy and divine word in a prophetic order. And that includes tearing down false doctrines and lies that are perpetrated throughout our history and that are still going on in the church today. And tonight is no exception. Tonight is probably going to tear down one of the biggest lies that has ever been told in church. We're going to tear down one of the biggest lies that 99.5% of all of you have said and believe and continue to say. But in the name of Jesus, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we're going, to, we're going to destroy all of this. Sister Daphne, I see you watching. Sister, God bless you. Sister Gwen, I see you're on. God bless you. Um, as always, before we pray, my wife, Prophetess, she's here with me in the name of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> my father, we're at home this evening because my father wasn't feeling well. So those of you who truly have a good relationship with the Lord, those of you who know what prayer is, please keep Apostle Mitchell lifted up in prayer that God will continue to mend and restore anything that's going on within his body because he still has a lot of work to do. Pray for my mother, Ethel, in the name of Jesus, as she takes care of Father. Um, I bless you and praise, uh, uh, take, uh, pray for my brother Maurice also in Jesus' name. God is so good. So again, we bring you greetings from Sound Doctrine Deliverance Ministries. We bring you from Word First Ministries. We're just going to have a good time in the Lord tonight. I have a few announcements, and I'm going to take care of that before the study so we can get into it. But first, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you and I bless you for this gift that's called today. I thank you and I bless you for all the adversity I've seen today. I thank you. And I bless you for the trials and tribulations. I thank you and I bless you for the good times and the bad times that all took place today. Because, Father, in every situation, I was able to see your mercy. In every situation, I was able to see your grace. In every situation, Father God, I was able to see something that I had to learn. And you still keep me and you still sustain me. And it's not just me, Father, but my brothers and my sisters all across this land who had to go to work or who was off or who had to deal with the children or who had to deal with a neighbor, whatever we had to go through, Father, we're here right now at this time together in the name of Jesus to magnify your name because you gave us another day. 
I thank you, Father, for everything you're about to unfold and unveil in this study on this evening. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you touch the minds of those who heart are hardened. Touch the minds and the hearts of those who believe the lies and, and the cliches that have been passed down in the name of religion. Touch the minds and the hearts of those who desire to know your truth and to shape and form and transform their lives to be wrapped around your truth. Touch us all, Father, in the name of Jesus as only you can. If we have sin or transgression in our life, wash us in the blood of the Lamb. Make us clean and holy in your sight, Father God, that you would receive our worship and that you would receive our praise in the name of Jesus. And now, Holy Spirit, I ask that you anoint me again with that anointing that makes teaching and explaining your word easy, kept in context, in the name of Jesus, so that we all could be better men and women of yours. I honor you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, Sister Sharon, God bless you. I see you there. First, let me get these announcements out the way. Um, first and foremost, as I said before, keep uh, my father, keep Apostle Mitchell up in prayer. He was a little under the weather. He wasn't feeling good, but we know we have service on tomorrow and we're praying that the Holy Spirit will rejuvenate him and have him ready to go to deliver whatever word it is that God would have him to bring to his people. Secondarily, my brothers and sisters, remember to turn your clocks forward an hour. Please remember, they say at two o'clock, but I already turned mine forward. The phone's gonna take care of themselves. But all your other clocks and your alarm clock, remember to turn your clock forward an hour. I would hate for you to be going to your house of worship tomorrow morning only to find out that everybody already has service and they're gone and you're late. It happens. So please remember to turn your clocks forward an hour. And the last announcement, in case you have not heard, in case you have not seen on Facebook, um, this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday that's coming up, Prophet Sarah will be in revival at the Word First Church. Uh, the subject, the topic is spiritual warfare. That's Friday night at 7 p.m., Saturday night at 7 p.m., and it concludes Sunday morning at 10 a.m. worship service at Word First Church down in the beautiful city of Norfolk, Virginia on Sewell's Point Road. Come on out. Have a good time. Find out what the Lord has to say to you in the name of Jesus. And my last one, brothers and sisters, this is I, I, all my young ministers, anybody called to ministry. If you are not in a building, but you know you're called to ministry, and so you use your social media platform to, to, to preach and teach the word of God, listen, do not allow anybody to tell you it's insignificant. You shouldn't do it on social media. You need to be in a building or something like that. It's not as effective. Let me share some information, some data with you that we have gotten, that's official data as far as sound doctrine deliverance ministry goes. Nigeria, Bermuda, Canada, Mexico, the Philippines, Somalia, Africa, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. Let me say that again. Nigeria, Bermuda, Canada, Mexico, the Philippines, Somalia, South Africa, the United Kingdom, Germany, Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, Richmond, Virginia, Garysburg, North Carolina, Raleigh, Atlanta, Georgia, Petersburg, Emporia, Dayton, Ohio, Weldon, Greensboro, Chicago, New York, California, and Gaston. These are at the top of the demographics that watches us every time God allows us to come on. These are just the ones at the top. There are others further down, but these are the ones at the top. And my young ministers, I need you to hear the countries. We're not even talking about the cities and the states in this country. We're talking about Nigeria. We're talking about Bermuda. We're talking about Canada and Mexico. We're talking about the Philippines and Somalia. We're talking about South Africa. We're talking about the United Kingdom. We're talking about Germany and Australia. 
taking the word of God around the world by any means necessary. This is what the Holy Spirit does. When you are obedient to his guidance, when you rightly divide his word, there is no telling whose life you will be able to reach. So I encourage all of you, my young brothers and sisters in ministry, do not allow anybody with their own preconceived notions of what your ministry should be to stomp on and kill your dreams because you have no idea what God has in store for you. Now, having said that, if you have your Bibles with you, Turn to the 67th Psalm. The 67th Psalm. I have plenty of notes tonight. I want to try to breathe and go easy because I'm telling you this Bible study right here tonight is going to destroy one of the bigger, biggest lies ever spoken, quoted, and believed by the church. And I'm willing to guarantee you that the majority of us has at one time or another said this or believe this? And God said, not so. Not so. So turn to Psalm 67. I'm reading from the King James Version, the Thompson Chain Reference Study Bible. Whatever version you have, we're going to get there together. Because we have some scripture that we're going to rightly divide and break down. But this is what Psalm 67, there's only six, seven verses. This is what the word of God says. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. Pause. That way, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among the nations. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. And God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. That's all that it says. It's a song or a hymn. That's what the entire book of Psalms is. But you have no idea what's significant about the 67th Psalm that makes it different from every other Psalm in the book. I'm going to read it one more time. And if you think you know what it is and you're logged on right now, please put it in the comment section so I can read it out. But this is what it says. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. That thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Sister Elaine, I see you, Sister Claudette. Psalm 67. It's 150 psalms or hymns, or songs, or whatever you want to say. Psalm 67 is different. It's differentiated from the rest of them for one reason. Because Psalm 67 is the source of one of the biggest lies ever spoken, adopted, and quoted, and believed by the majority of the church. Did you hear what I said? Psalm 67 is the source of one of the biggest lies ever spoken, adopted, quoted, and believed by the majority of the church. And why? Because it's taken so far out of context and is wrapped around what man wanted to mean 
instead of leaving it as a song of praise that was written to God for God by the people. So what am I talking about? When the praises go up, the blessings come down. Everybody has heard that in church. Everybody. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what church you've been to. I don't care what pastor or minister you sat under. I don't care what worship leader you had. Everybody that has been to church has heard the saying, when the praises go up, the blessings come down. We've all heard it or said it or believed it. That is coming from Psalm 67, taken out of context, and it is a lie. Nowhere, listen to me, nowhere, nowhere, when I say nowhere, I mean no and where, put them together, nowhere, from Genesis to Revelation, nowhere does the word of God say when the praises go up, the blessings come down, nowhere, it's a lie, it's a complete and utter lie, it is something derived by man based on the 67th Psalm. And the reason that they say it, number one, is because it makes people feel good. Number two, it's a way to get in your pocket. Number three, it's just a flat out lie. And let me say this and make it perfectly clear. Anything that's not truth is a lie. Amen. Period. Anything that's not truth, it does not matter what the intent is. If it's not truth, it's a lie. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. It's not biblical, it's not scriptural, and it is a lie. But they base it off of Psalm 67. So we're going to, we're going to dig into this and, and, and find out why. How is it a lie? It's easy. When the praises go up, pay attention to the wording. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. Praises from who? That's the first question anybody with a rational spiritual mind should ask. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. Your pastor say it. Your worship leader say it. Praises from who? Turn to Psalm 150. Turn to Psalm 150. And again, everybody has heard the 150th Psalm. We've read it a thousand times. <clears throat> this is what Psalm 150 say. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. Praises from who or praises from what? Because according to Psalm 150, everything that has breath is supposed to praise the Lord. So what does everything that has breath mean? It's self-explanatory. Everything means everything. Breath means breath. Everything that has breath means nothing more than everything that has breath. It didn't say the people that has breath. It didn't say the adults that have breath. It didn't say the children that has breath. It says everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now, what does it mean to praise the Lord? It means to, to, to say things that's uplifting, to say things that's encouraging, to say things that are loving. But why? You usually praise somebody for something they've done for you. You can praise your children for bringing in a good report card. You can praise your, your, your neighbor for the way he cut his grass. Does that mean that your children or the neighbor is a good person? Does that mean that you're a good person? No. It just means that based on the situation and the circumstances, you are now finding yourself in a certain emotional state where you want to exude happiness and joy in the form of praise. 
So when the Bible says that everything that has breath should praise the Lord, it means everything that has breath should praise the Lord. Why? Because he's God. The trees can praise the Lord. Animals can praise the Lord. We may not understand how they do it, just because you don't understand it, it doesn't mean that it does not happen. Because animals have breath. Trees use breath. Fish use breath. Everything that uses oxygen, uses breath, has to praise the Lord. When we see the trees swaying in the wind, that's how they praise the Lord. When we hear the birds singing early in the morning, when we hear the dogs howling and barking, that's how they praise the Lord. It has breath, and even nature bears witness that there is a God. This does not distinguish one life form from another. It just says everything that has breath should praise the Lord. So are we to believe that when the trees or the birds or the flowers or the fish or the dogs or the cats praise the Lord, blessings come down? Because they tell you in church, when the praises go up, blessings come down. You can have people that have no knowledge or have want to have nothing to do with God like we do. But they get a check or they get some good news or somebody died and left them something. And in a jovial moment, they, oh, thank God, they are praising the Lord. But they're not saved. There's no distinction here, brothers and sisters. So why do I keep harping on that? I'm going to tell you why I harp on that. Go to John. Chapter 4. John chapter 4 in your New Testament. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Verse 23 and 24. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. This is what the word of God says. But the hour cometh. And now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And when they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So there is a distinction in the eyes of God between praise and worship. The Bible just told us in the 150th Psalm that everything that has breath praise the Lord. But Jesus has just declared God is seeking out true worshipers. The Bible does not say when worship go up, praise come down. I mean, blessings come down. But God is seeking true worshipers. Listen to what's being said, brothers and sisters. The lie that's always been told in church is when praise go up, the blessings come down. The Bible declared that everything that has breath ought to praise the Lord. Jesus said God is seeking true worshipers that worship him in spirit and in truth. So do we not think that if God was going to bless something, he would bless that which he sought after, which is worshipers? But you don't hear anybody in church say, when true worship goes up, the blessings come down. Why? Because worship requires something that praise does not require. And here's where we're about to start getting into the heart of this lesson. People that worship and people that know what true worship is do something that people that just praise don't have to do. Well, what is it? I'll tell you, praise is not, was not, and can never be the key to unlocking the blessings of God. So get that out of your mind. Every time you had a minister or a pastor or a worship leader or whoever else, a recording artist that tells you when the praise go up, the blessings come down, I'm telling you right now in your face, and I'll tell you with them right there, they lied. They don't have a scripture from Genesis 1 to Revelation 20, 22 to back up that statement. Because it's not in the book. It's not even biblical. Now, how do we unlock the blessings of God? That's a good question. Turn to 1 Samuel 
chapter 15. Oh, this is a study tonight. You're going to have to turn or write it down. It's up to you, whichever one you do. But the word is going to be rightly divided so that you can understand it and you can, you, you can make a change in your life so that you can receive the blessings of God if you're able to, because a lot of church folk are not able to. 1 Samuel chapter 15. It's a fundamental principle. It's a fundamental spiritual principle that has to be carried out in order for you to unlock God's storeroom. In order for you to receive all those blessings that they told you praise would make rain down. And you're going to find the key right here in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I'm only going to read two verses. I'm going to read verse 22 and 23. This is what it says. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Now we know he's talking to, to, to Saul right here. But I'm going to read this again, and I'm going to read it just a little bit slower. And I need you to hear what's being said. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. If you want to know what makes the blessings come down? If you want to know what makes God smile upon your life, if you want to know what unlocks the storerooms of heaven, it's not when the praises go up. It's one word that the majority of church folk are afraid of, run away from, and don't want to hear nobody teach on. Obedience. Obedience is what makes the blessings come down. Obedience is what unlocks the storeroom of heaven. Obedience is what makes God pour out blessings in your life. Obedience is what wins the heart of God. It ain't got nothing to do with praises going up. It's about your obedience. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. If you like your life the way it is, and you don't want your apple cart turned over, then turn off this broadcast right now. Stop listening. Because I'm about to shake up your apple cart through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I'm about to upset some lies that have been told to you. It's about to turn your life upside down. If you call yourself a child of God, I promise you, you might say, I don't have a problem being obedient. Yes, you do. You're not as obedient as you think you are, or you would have more blessings than you already have. And I'm going to prove it by the word. Because the first thing we need to understand is, what does obedience mean? What is obedience defined as? Obedience means to hear, to trust, to submit, and to surrender to God and his word completely. Let me say it again. This is what it means. Then I'm going to tell you how it's defined. Obedience means to hear, to trust, to submit, and to surrender to God and his word completely. See that word on the end, completely? Yeah, we're going to get into that. But here's how obedience is defined. Obedience, according to scripture, is defined as dutiful, Submissive compliance to the commands of one in authority. 
obedience, dutiful, submissive compliance to the commands of one in authority. That's the biblical definition of obedience. Dutiful, let me say it one more time, dutiful, submissive compliance to the commands of one in authority. Now, using this definition, I'm going to give you a five-fold element of biblical obedience I'm going to break it down. It's a five-fold thing. We always talk about five-fold ministry. This five-fold was in, in play long before the five-fold ministry ever was. It's a five-fold uh, 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 union when it comes to the type of obedience that God is talking about. Number one, dutiful. Number two, compliance. Number three, no, excuse me. Number one is dutiful. Number two is submissive. Number three is compliance. Number four is commands. And number five is one in authority. Because we just said what the definition was. Dutiful, submissive compliance to the commands of one in authority. So let's take the definition piece by piece. Dutiful. Dutiful means... It is our obligation to obey God and all of his word. Just like Jesus fulfilled his duty to the father by dying on the cross for our sins. Dutiful means it is our obligation to obey God and all of. Let me say that with emphasis and all of his word. Just like Jesus fulfilled his duty to the Father by dying on the cross for our sins. Number two, submissive. It means we completely yield and surrender our will to God's. That's the definition of submissive. We completely yield and surrender our will to God's. Remember in the garden? And Jesus said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will. Let thy will be done. It's because Jesus was completely submissive to the Father while he completed what he had been sent to do. Number three, compliance means we give in to any request, wish, or demand made by somebody else. That's what compliance means. We give in to any request, wish, or demand made by somebody else. So what's the command? God's holy, infallible word, period. That's the command. God's word. Who's the one in authority? God. God. Now, let me make something clear to you. Jesus displayed... Two types of obedience. And everybody who says they're a child of God and says, I'm obedient, I don't have a problem with obedience. If you really are, then you should be able to tell us what are the two type of obediences that Jesus displayed. Because if you don't know what both of them are, it's impossible to say you've been doing it. He displayed the twofold nature of, of obedience. The first one is passive obedience. The first nature of obedience is passive obedience. And what does passive obedience does? Passive obedience stresses the fact that Jesus did not resist or fight against the cross or anything else that was done to him. Jesus did not resist or fight against anything that was done to him. He was obedient to the will of the Father and he was passive against anything that came up against him. And let me make something perfectly clear. Being passive does not mean being weak. Amen. Being passive means he was humble. He was meek. 
He understood that there was something greater going on and the one who sent him had an expectation that regardless of what he faced, he could contain himself, he could control his temper and he would accept whatever he had to accept in order to do whatever it is he was sent to do. That's what passive obedience is. So after we get down with passive obedience, what's the other one? The other one is active obedience. What is active obedience? Active obedience speaks to Jesus, the things that he did and, and, and the things that he, he partook in while yet still leading a sinless life. He was in perfect obedience to the Father. So on the, on the passive obedience, we understood that he didn't react to the things that was done to him. On the active obedience, we understood that everything that he did, he did it sinlessly. He did it following his father's word. That's the twofold nature of, of, of obedience. We are, we are submissive to the will of God while following the will of God. We are submissive to the word of God while walking out the word of God. Obedience is not hard spiritually, but is difficult naturally because the natural man wants to do what the natural man wants to do. And that's the problem with so many people in the church. They have a problem with obedience. And we're going to get into that. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I told you, according to the Holy Spirit, that we were going to start putting meat on the table. It's no more milk with sound doctrine delivers ministries. It's meat on the table. Amen. And this is something that you have to chew on. And sometimes chewing meat is hard to swallow. But in, if, if you want the meat to do what it's supposed to do for the body, you have to be able to swallow it and digest it. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to start at verse 5. It's just three verses. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, it took upon him the form of a servant. It was made in the likeness of men and being found and fashioned as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The problem with today's church is people expect God's full time blessings for their part-time obedience. Jesus. Jesus. Did you catch that? The problem with church folk today is church folk expect God's full-time blessings for their part-time obedience. Church folk have been lied to so long about when the praises go up, the blessings come down, that they completely forgot about obedience. And as I said before, I'll say again, nowhere in Scripture does the Bible ever say God blessings come down because you praise Him. Nowhere. Nope. Jesus said God is looking for true worshipers. And the Bible does not even say God pours out His blessings when you worship him. But I give you a challenge. You can look at every instance in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation when somebody was obedient to everything God told them to do that right after their act of obedience, God blessed them. Jesus. Now, we're not, you're not going to get away that far, that easy. We're going back to 1 Samuel because that's where we were. But I'm going to tell you the problem with the church. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we were already there. So if you had it marked, just flip back to it. Here's the part a lot of people are not going to like. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, 
I'm in 2 Samuel. Let me get to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter 15, <clears throat> verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Why is God so big on obedience? Why was it necessary that when Jesus was incarnated, when Jesus came in the flesh, why was it necessary and why does the Bible stress that he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? And here's where the church comes in. The Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou has rejected the word of God. He has also rejected thee from being king. Lucifer rebelled. Let that sink in. Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covered that was in the garden of paradise of God. Lucifer, one of the highest created angels there was. Lucifer rebelled against God. The Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We also know that the Bible said, suffer not a witch to live. I need you to get the spiritual implications of what's being said to you tonight. Lucifer rebelled against God. Lucifer did not remain obedient to the will of God. Lucifer rebelled. Why? Because he wanted something. He desired something. He lusted after something. He coveted something that was not meant for him. Now ask me why I paused. I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to try to lower my tone. Lucifer rebelled against God. He rebelled against the will of God. He rebelled against the desires of God because he desired something. He lusted after something. He coveted something. He wanted something that was never meant for him. Half the church rebelled against God and will not operate in obedience because they want something, they desire something, they covet something, or they call themselves something that was never meant for them. God didn't give it to them, so they decided, I'm going to get it any way I have to get it, by any means necessary, even if I have to lie on God. Jesus. God created Lucifer. He's a created angel. God told him who he was. God told him what he was. You are the anointed cherub that covereth. God placed him in the position that was designed for him. But that wasn't good enough. Because in his mind, he came up with the conclusion that God was wrong. In his mind, he came up with the conclusion that I can do what God is doing better than God can. Let's talk about the church. God made us. God made man. God placed man in his position. God told him what he would have him to do. God made woman. God placed woman in her position. God told woman what he would have her to do. God made everything and placed it where he wanted it. But the problem is, and the disobedience and rebellion comes in, when people, man and woman, make up in their mind, I don't have to be obedient to the word and will of God because I know better than God does. So I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to say what I want to say. And I don't care who feels like what about it. It's all about me. A lot of people in the church can't be obedient to God because they still have that rebellious Lucifer spirit dwelling inside of them. Period. And some of these people that I'm talking about go to church and praise every Saturday or every Sunday. 
So how is it if you're in direct rebellion against God? If you are disobedient to God, if you don't follow the word of God, but you can still go into church and praise, how is it that you think God is going to pour out blessings for somebody who praises with their lips, but their heart is far from them? Please make it make sense. Please. Lucifer was higher and closer to God in his original state than any of us have ever been. And he rebelled. He went against the will of God because he wanted something that God didn't give him and he wanted to be placed where God didn't place him. Does that sound like anything or anybody you know in the church? Jesus. Does it sound like any people that you know? What God said can't be right. Oh, that was for them back then. That can't be what the word means now. What God said can't be right because I know I'm called to be this, that, or the other. What God said can't be right because I feel like I should be doing more and people should have all eyes on me. So you're in active disobedience. You're in active rebellion against God because it's not about you. Jesus. That's the church. That ain't got nothing to do with unsaved people. That has to do with people who go to church every Saturday or every Sunday and go to Bible study and go to Sunday school. Who don't understand what true obedience to God is. Now, I'm going to take a little side note because somebody came up with these things we call wedding vows. And back in the day, they used to say the wife was supposed to say to love, honor, and obey her husband. And women, when the feminist movement came in, women had a problem with that word obey. Oh, they had, I ain't obeying no man. I ain't got to obey no man. That was the thought of women. The word of God says that wives are supposed to honor their husbands like they honor Christ. Because the husband is the head of the wife. They took that context right there and that's why they plugged obey into wedding vows. Now here's, here's the kicker. You have some women pastors. I don't know how they got that, but that's another story. You have some women in ministry who tell the women in their church, if your husband ain't saved, you ain't got to obey him. If he ain't saved, what would you obey him for? <clears throat> the word of God says wives are to honor their husbands as Christ. The husband is the head of the wife. That's what the word says. So if obey is the only word you can use you put it in there, but you put it in there in context. It does not make a discrepancy. It does not make a side note to say, well, if he's hurt, if he's if he's saved, then you honor him. If he's unsaved, don't. Because the Bible says, if the husband is not saved, the sanctified wife can win him over by her godly attitude, by her godly conduct, which means... Even if your husband is not saved, you still acknowledge him and respect him as the head of the house because he's still the man. Amen. Husbands, if your wives are not saved, you can win her over through your godly conduct, through your godly conversation, because you are representing God. And I think that's the one thing that men fail to realize. When God put Adam on the earth, Adam was obedient to God up until he failed. But God put Adam on the earth to be his representative on the earth. Everything on the earth was supposed to look at Adam and understand what God was and what God did. Amen. When Adam decided to be disobedient and sin entered the picture, then that fellowship was broken. But the word still says that the head of Christ is God. The head of man is Christ. The head of woman is man. So ladies, let me correct a lie that you've been told to from the pulpit. 
Even if your husband is not saved, he's still the man. He's still the head. You still honor and follow your husband. That's the word of God. And it does not change based on his status. Now, before some men go flying off the deep end, the Bible says that the wife is supposed to honor her husband. It ain't say nothing about any other man. Honor your husband. You respect other men. But the respect and the love and the attention and the patience you share with your husband exceeds any other man. Amen. So all of you women who have your pastors or your whatever telling you if your husband is not saved, you don't have to honor him. You don't have to respect him. You don't have to listen to them. Tell him to show you that in the word. That's why the Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing because you knew he won't save before you married him. You knew he had no relationship with God before you said I do, but because you saw his bank account, because he licked on you and touched you a certain way, you said I do. And now you got some 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 out of place person in a pulpit that's tearing the scripture apart, telling you you don't have to. You have to be obedient to the word of God above all else. Lucifer was disobedient to what God wanted. Disobedience and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Do you not understand what I'm saying to you? Every time you are disobedient to the word of God, you are in a rebellious state. I don't care who you are. I don't care how you try to break it down, how you try to sugarcoat it, how you try to get around it. You can't. Anything that's not complete compliance and obedience to God is rebellion. Anything that is not the truth is a lie. Anything that is not perfect in the sight of God is sin. There is no middle ground when it comes to these biblical principles, and I need you to understand. So, as again I said, whoever told you when the praises go up, the blessings come down, lied. It's not biblical. It's no such thing in Scripture. When you are obedient to God, the blessings come down. And like I said before, I'll say it again. 95% of the people who call themselves Christians have a problem with obedience to God. Because they don't understand what true obedience is because of the people they're listening to. Because the leaders aren't obedient. Jesus. But we're going to get into that. Jesus. We're going to get into that. When you fully commit, listen. We have people that join churches. We have people that join these fellowships and they love their pastors. They'll do anything their pastor tell them to do. If your pastor tell you to go stand outside in a, in a parking lot in a pouring rain and wait for a purple unicorn with a green elf sitting on his back to come down the street whistling rainbows, you got people that will go out there waiting for that. They will do anything their pastor tell them to do. But when they need help, or if they're in a particular state, the pastor ain't nowhere to be seen. So explain to me, church people, how you can be 150% obedient to your pastor, but you can't be obedient to God. Jesus. You want God's blessing for being obedient to a man. And in some cases, a woman. But you can't be obedient to God. Or, or Elijah, I'm obedient to God. No, you're not. Because obedience to God means following God's word. 
Being obedient to God means you apply the word in context, rightly divided as God gave it, and you don't make allowances because your pastor said we're not making allowances for certain sins and for certain things because it makes them feel good when God said the exact opposite. Your pastor is standing in direct rebellion to the word of God, and you're standing alongside your pastor. Where have we seen this before? When Lucifer was yeah. disobedient to God, when yeah. Lucifer rebelled against God, the Bible says he took a third of the angels with him because people that want to do wrong always want to find people that's going to justify their wrong so they don't have to take the fall by themselves. Jesus. True obedience means God, teach me your word in context Rightly divided so that I can govern my life according to your word and not according to a man-made denomination, not according to a family tradition, not according to cliches passed down through the ages. Complete obedience to God means if God said thou shalt not kill, that means not just physically kill, but with the words of my mouth, I will not kill. Complete obedience to God means if God said thou shalt not lust, then we will have the same mindset that Job had. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? We don't try to find ways around what God said when we're in complete obedience to God. And let me tell you something right now. Obedience never makes sense. Jesus. Complete obedience will never make sense. Because complete obedience relies on your level of faith. Amen. And faith will have you doing things that make no natural sense. Because faith is a spiritual component of our Christian life. When Jesus told Peter, come out the boat and walk on the water, Jesus. that made absolutely no sense. But Peter, in the beginning... He had two things in his favor. Number one, he had faith. Number two, he was obedient to the word spoken. So he stepped out of the boat onto the water by faith. Jesus said, come. He was obedient to what Jesus said. As soon as he took his focus off of Jesus and started paying attention to everything going on around him, he began to sink. When God tells you to do something, it does not matter if it sounds like it makes logical sense to anybody in this world. If God said it, God meant it. The question is, when God tells you to do something that doesn't seem rational, that doesn't seem like it makes sense. And your pastor or your religious leader say, I don't believe God told you that. You should fast on it and pray a little bit longer. God is going to tell me and I'll share with you. Who are you going to be obedient to? Hmm. That's the question. Speak, Lord. Because as I just said, you have more people in the church that grew up in the church that's more obedient to their pastor than they are to God. Amen. And somewhere... Down the line, the rubber is going to meet the road and you're going to have to make a decision. Amen. You're going to have to decide who you're going to be obedient to, who you're going to listen to. But as I said, I will share it again. Every instance in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, every instance when God told someone to do something and they were completely obedient to the word of God, blessings came. It does not say every time somebody prays, the blessings came down. It does not say every time somebody worshiped, the blessings came down. But there is not an instance of obedience where it was not rewarded and disobedience where it was not punished. You don't believe me? Look it up for yourself. When the praises go up, the blessings come down is a lie. And that's why I told you before, stop listening to all these lies and cliches that's being said in the church that's being taught as if it's gospel truth because it's not. Now, Luke 6. Luke 6. I'm going to read three verses to you. Luke, Luke 6, starting at verse 46. 
Luke 6, starting at verse 46. It's in red. This is what the word says. <clears throat> and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Why do you call Jesus Lord? Why do you call God your Father, and you cannot be obedient to the Word of God? Why? Why? And again, I'm talking to the church. Because 98% of the church pick and choose what scriptures they're going to be obedient to and what scriptures they're going to change the meaning because it no longer fits them. Submission to God means, Lord, I'm obedient to all of your word. I'm striving with all that's within me to stay obedient to what your word says. So if God says, thou shalt not do this, even if your pastor say, yeah, you can do that now, but God said you can't, are you obedient to God or your pastor? Jesus. And if you're obedient to your pastor, then let you praise your pastor and see if he bless you. God, and you say, well, I'm receiving some blessings. We're all receiving some blessings. It rains on the just as well as the unjust. But we're talking about unlocking the storeroom of heaven and God pouring out blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. That only comes through complete and total obedience to the will and the word of God. And the sad part is a lot of people that grew up in church don't even know what the will of God is. They have no idea what the will of God is. They have no idea what's contained in the word of God because they don't search the scriptures for themselves. They rely on a spiritual leader to tell them what the word means. And then you're obedient to what that leader says. And I can give you a thousand examples, but why continue to be the dead horse? Because some people are going to believe what they want to believe. Some people are going to interpret the scriptures the way they want them interpreted. And then they wonder why God is not answering their prayer and why God is not blessing them the way he said in his book. It's simple because you're disobedient because you have a spirit of rebellion in your heart and you have a lying spirit in your ear. And the two cannot coincide with God because God demands complete and total submission to him. My pastor told me I was going to be a pastor and an apostle. But it ain't what God said in his word. So who are you listening to? Who is your pastor listening to to even tell you something like that when it goes against the word of God? Brothers and sisters, and I hate to go here, but I'm going to go here. When our ancestors came over, and was placed in slavery and had masters over top of them, plantation owners. If they said, boy, go out in that field and pick them cotton and potatoes until your, your hands fall off. If you didn't move when he said move and do what he said do, you got your back whipped. You got chained to a pole and whipped. You are beaten into submission. If master told, told the, the, the girl, go up in that room and take that dress off and spread yourself across that bed till I get up there. And she didn't. As pretty as she may be, she got tied to a whipping post and got the flesh whipped off her body. She was beaten into submission. And it's amazing how that mentality has been passed on throughout our, our, our ancestral history 
to most black people today that when somebody on this earth tell you to do something, you jump and do it to please them, to keep them happy. But God, who will never tie you to a whipping post and whip the flesh off your back, God, who will never put your life in jeopardy, God, who laid his life down for you, can tell you to do something. And because man says otherwise, you will not be obedient to God. You don't show him the same respect you will show a slave master. You don't show God the same respect you show your boss on your job. You don't show God the same respect you show a police officer when he pull your car over. You don't show God the same respect you show a judge in his courtroom. But you want God to bless you while you'll be obedient to everybody but God. How does that work? Lucifer's disobedience got him kicked out of heaven. Adam's disobedience got him kicked out of the garden. So what makes you think your disobedience is going to get you blessed? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. In anything that God said in his word for us to do or not to do, that you do the opposite of, you are operating in the spirit of rebellion. Cut and dry. I'm not sugarcoating it for you. You are rebelling against the word of God. And God's word don't change. And this word is going to be your final judge and jury. Because God is going to judge you according to his word. That's why I keep telling you the word of God does not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's word does not change. The interpretation of his word does not change. What his word meant 2,000 years ago, his word means today. Why? Because God's word is just and it's infallible. And God is going to judge you according to your obedience or disobedience of his word. Period. So every time you subscribe to a false doctrine, every time you subscribe to these false teachers who's teaching you a false doctrine, you are describing to rebellion and witchcraft and disobedience, and you have to be punished. It's as simple as that. Obedience is the one thing that's missing from the church today. Obedience to God. Let me make that clear. Obedience to God. And my sisters, you know, I, 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 I hate to pick on you, but I got to call a spade a spade. It's so many of y'all that are completely disobedient and out of order because of the feminist movement, because let's burn our bras, because we don't need men, because of all this other independent stuff that, that the world and society got you believing, that you have bled it over into the church, and I'm sure God is shaking his head, saying, who is this that's taking these censors and offering strange fire before my throne? You are disobedient and out of order. And it ain't just you, because it's a lot of men that co signs it that turns the other cheek, that closes their eyes to what's going on in the house of God in the name of, I want to be on the right side of history. You can be on the right side of history and find yourself on the wrong side of God. Jesus. So you choose which one is more important to you. I hate to keep bringing this man's name up, but I'm going to bring it up because Barack Obama, who confessed to be a Christian, he wanted to be on the right side of history and he fell out of favor on the wrong side with God because you cannot be a Christian and blatantly do everything that God told you not to do. You're being disobedient. When the praises go up, the blessings come down is not biblical brothers and sisters. They base that off of a misinterpretation and misapplication of Psalm 67. When the praises go up, the blessings come down should not be spoken in church because it's a lie. When obedience is your lifestyle, the blessings come down. If you tell your child, cut the grass, 
clean your room, and I'm going to give you your allowance. Cut the grass, clean your room, and I'm going to pay you for your services. How can your child go play kickball, get on the game, and play the game for three hours, wash, eat something, and leave the, 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 the sink the, full of dishes, and expect to be blessed? The child was disobedient. The child did what it thought it wanted to do and still expected the blessing that was promised. God does not operate in ignorance. As a man sows, so should he also reap. So if you reap, if you sow to disobedience, you're going to reap the reward for disobedience. It's plain and simple. Jesus was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So if God, if God, listen, because a lot of you still don't understand Jesus is God. So let me break it down for you. If God left his throne, came down here on earth in the likeness of sinful flesh and was obedient to the point where he was beaten, ridiculed, and crucified to please the Father. And you say, I'm going to take up my cross and follow him. And you say, I can drink from the cup that you drank from. How is it that you can't be obedient to the smallest things in life? I ain't going to talk to you no more. I'm going to leave. The purpose of this study was to let you know again, another saying, another cliche, Another religious folklore that had been passed down to you was a lie. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. That's not biblical. It's a lie. When God sees your obedience to his word and his will, that's what he blesses. Take it how you want to take it or don't take it at all. I'm good. Walk in wisdom, grow in grace. Oh, there will not be a Bible study. I will not be on next week because as I told you at the beginning, Prophet Sarah is going to be in revival Friday night at 7, Saturday night at 7, Sunday morning at 10 at Word First Church down in Norfolk, Virginia. Come on out and have a good time. So because of the revival, of course, we won't be going live. But Well, I won't be going live, but the revival will be broadcast live so you will see her. You won't get me. Then the following week is whatever the Lord says. But come join us at the revival. The topic is, is spiritual warfare. Come get fed from the word of God. Walk in wisdom, grow in grace. Until next time.